Hello YouTube, this is Eric from Coder Snacks. Today we'll talk about one of my favorite interview problems, splitting a sentence without spaces into its component words. Let's get started. First, why is it a favorite? Partially because it has some depth, but also because it actually has a number of interesting uses. For example, you can use it to parse words out of a URL, or you can use it to parse text in languages that don't even have spaces, like Japanese. So let's get into the problem. First, we should note that the problem as it stands is a bit underspecified. Particularly in an interview situation, there are some questions we'd like to ask. For example, what types of characters do we need to deal with? Do we need to deal with punctuation? Do we need to deal with capitalization? Do we need to deal with Unicode characters? Depending on the answers to these questions, we might want to do some sort of pre-processing of the string, or we may want to do some sort of special handling if we have Unicode characters. In general, we'd also like to think about what we do if we have no solutions to our problem, but in this case, we also want to think about what we do if we have multiple solutions to our problem. What if the sentence can be broken up in multiple different ways? Do we want to return one of the solutions? Do we want to return all of them? This is something we want to think about before we start coding. To focus more on the algorithm, we'll assume that the input is all lowercase letters, a through z, and the expected length of the string is unknown, but that we don't have to worry about memory constraints. We'll also assume for now that we will take any single usable solution, and we'll return none if there are no solutions. At first glance, it seems like maybe we could just read letters from the beginning of the string until we find a word, split it off, and keep going. You might have noticed there are some problems even with this example, but let's see what happens anyway. We'll write some code that reads characters starting at the beginning of the string and adds them to current word. If current word actually is a word, we'll add that to our list of completed words, then start a new word. At the end, if we don't have anything left in our current word buffer, then we win, and we can return the words. Otherwise, we return none. But when we run it on our sample string, it returns none. What happened? Let's print out what words and current word look like at the end. If you'd like, pause the video and guess what these values will be. So, how close was your guess? It gets the word on like we would expect, but as it's looking for the next word, we find pie is a word. Great, on to the list it goes, but unfortunately, ns and needles isn't a word, and in fact there's no word that starts with ns so it fails. We need some way to backtrack when we realize that on and pi isn't going to be a valid way to split the string so that we can go back and try on and pin. Backtracking can often be a sign we want to use recursion, so let's give that a try. Recursion lets you break your problem into subproblems that are the same kind but smaller. You can repeat this, and eventually the subproblems will be so small you can solve them easily. To write a program to do this, we need to do two things. One, find a way to break the problem into smaller problems, and two, figure out when the problem is small enough to easily solve. These two things are called the recursive case and the base case. The great part is, if we can figure out these two cases, we don't have to worry about how to actually solve subproblems after the top level. The recursive case will keep breaking them down and breaking them down until we get to the trivial part. We don't have to think about all this breaking down, we just have to say how to break it apart at the top level and treat the rest like a mystical black box. For our problem's recursive case, we're going to find a prefix of our string that's a word, and the smaller subproblem will be the rest of the string. If that subproblem has a solution, then great. Our answer is a list with our prefix word followed by the subproblem solution. If the subproblem doesn't have a solution, we'll look for another prefix word. If no prefix words work, then there's no solution, and we'll return none. So what do we do for the base case, or easy version of the problem? There are a couple of possibilities. First is the empty string. If you have an empty string, then your answer is an empty list. I prefer this answer, but some people find it unintuitive, so another way is to make the base case any string that is actually a word. If the string you're passed is a word, you can return the list containing that word. That works too. If you're not content with the magical black box version of recursion, here's a concrete example. We start with on pins and needles and look for a word prefix. We find on and recurse on the suffix pins and needles. That subproblem looks for a word prefix and finds pi and recurses again on ns and needles. None of the prefixes of ns and needles are a word though, 
So that subproblem will return none, and we'll go back to the pins and needles subproblem. Now we find pin and recurse into sand needles. It takes a few dead ends from there, but eventually that breaks into sand needles, and everything returns up, and we have a solution. Okay, enough talking, let's write code. In an interview setting, while I'll usually think about the recursive case first, I'll always write the base case first. It's really easy to forget about the base case if you're not used to it, and we want it first anyway, so we can return before the recursive case. Here's the base case we talked about earlier. If we're given an empty string, we just return an empty list. Easy. For the recursive case, we'll loop over the length of the string, looking at the first i characters of the string. If we find a word, we will call the same function, or recurse, on the rest of the string. We've also added another test that should fail. As much as I try, Eric isn't in the dictionary. In an interview setting, after you write your code, you should think about whether or not there are any bugs. In this code, there are two. If you'd like, pause the video and look over the code and see if you can find them. When we run the code, we get no answer for either test case. The reason is, our loop for i doesn't get every prefix of i. This is an easy mistake to make because when we're indexing into an array, we often use len array as the end condition, and since arrays are zero indexed, we go from zero to the length minus one, as Python xrange does not include the last number in the range. But in this case, you can think of i as being the number of characters we're taking from the front of our string, and we actually need the final loop where we're taking the whole string. So we mistakenly stop one short, and changing this to plus one fixes the first bug. The second bug is in our recursive case return. When we run the code now, we get something resembling what we want, but in a bunch of nested lists. This is because we're wrapping rest words in a list to add to our prefix word. But rest words is already a list. Our function always returns none or a list of words. So this is a quick fix once you see it. But in an interview situation, these kinds of bugs are easy to miss. So it's important to practice and see what kinds of mistakes you commonly make when you code. What's the runtime complexity of this code? A common mistake would be to say it's O of n squared, because we're looping over the string to find prefixes, which is O of n, and then we're looping over the suffixes for each prefix to find the rest of the answer, which is another O of n, but this is not correct. One way to see the runtime complexity of the code is to think about the call tree. Let's think about the worst case. Let's say we have a dictionary where everything is a word, unless it has a letter B in it. So we have a string with a bunch of A's and a B at the end. Doesn't the letter A look weird after a while? Anyway, so our function recurses for every prefix of this string, except the B at the end. This gives us O of N branches. Then, looking at the first branch, that also recurses for every prefix, and so on. The depth of this tree is O of N, so one upper bound is that there are O of N to the N calls, but that's a bit too high. A better way is to notice on the first branch, the branching factor is N minus 1, the next N minus 2, and so forth. This leads us to an answer of O of N factorial, which is closer, but not quite there. Here's the trick. If every partitioning is possible, then between any two letters, we could add a space or not. There are n-1 places we can choose whether or not to add a space, so our answer is O of 2 to the n. Clearly, we would like to do better than exponential. Where can we save time? Let's add a Q onto our example string. At some point, we're going to have a path where we have the prefix words on, pin, and sand, and we're left with needles Q. We'll do a bunch of work and find out that we can't split needles Q in any way, so we'll return none, and we'll try again with on, pins, and and. And we'll redo all the work only to find out we can't split needles Q again. Couldn't we avoid this duplicate work? Whenever you have a bad runtime using a recursive solution, you should consider memoization, or caching, and dynamic programming. We can use memoization here. The idea is we cache the answers to all of the subproblems that we figure out the answer to. This way, when we run into a subproblem we've already solved, we don't have to solve it again. To do this, we add some code before each return statement to add the result to the cache, and at the top of the function we check if the input is in the cache before we do any calculation. Just out of curiosity, we'll add some code to look at the state of the cache after a run.
The cache shows the result of every call made to the recursive function during execution. So what's the runtime complexity of this code? It's a little complicated, but it turns out to be O of n squared. The easiest way to imagine it is to think about some call in the middle of execution. Let's take our worst case again. Think of this as a table showing every possible entry in the cache. In the worst case, every box will eventually be filled with none since there are no solutions. How much work does it take to fill one of the entries? To fill in the cache entry 7th from the end, we have to do 7 dictionary lookups and 6 cache lookups. In general, to fill in the nth box, we have to do n dictionary lookups and cache lookups. And we have n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 and so on, which is O of n squared. So, what about a dynamic programming solution? Think about the cache we've made for the memoization approach. What if we just fill it ourselves without recursion? The idea is, we start from the end, looking at each suffix of the string. To fill each cell of the cache, we see whether the whole suffix is a word, but we also see if we can break our suffix into a prefix that's a word and a suffix that we've already solved. That sounds a little complex, so let's look at an example. Here we have a table. Under each letter will be an answer for whether the suffix from that letter to the end has a splitting solution. We start by looking up s, which is not a word. There aren't any splits to consider yet, so we move on. Next, we look up es, which turns out to be a word. Okay, well, that means we have a solution for es. Next, we look up less. Less isn't in the dictionary, but we also have to look up prefixes that match with current solutions. ES is a solution, so we also look up L, which is not a word. The next few go similarly. Dulls, edels, and edels aren't words, and neither are the prefixes that go with S. DL, EDL, and EEDL. DL is not a very good word ending, as it turns out. Now we get to needles. Needles is a word, and while needle is not a word, we only need one of them to be true. In this case, the value is a list with the word itself, needles. D and ND don't help our cause much, but notice that for each of these, we're now doing three lookups, one for the whole suffix, and one for each entry in our table that has a solution so far. For the next entry, AND needles, when we look up AND, we find it's a word. This matches with the entry we have for needles, so we put an entry into our table for AND followed by the partial solution we already have. We enter AND plus needles into our table. Similarly, for sand needles, we find sand is a word, which also matches with needles, so we put that entry into our table as well. N doesn't help us at all, but both I and P work, since in and pin are both words. Notice how each time we add a new entry to the table, we do more lookups. Finally, we get to the beginning, and we have our complete answer, on pin sand needles. The complexity of this code is also O of N squared. There are n cells to fill, and for each cell, you could conceivably have to do n lookups in the worst case. Let's write the code to do this. We'll start by making our table as a list. Each entry represents the solution from the corresponding point in the string to the end, and we'll fill these with none. For each entry in the table, starting from the end and working towards the beginning, we'll do the following. We'll check if the suffix itself is a word, and if so, we'll put it in the table. If not, we'll start looking at prefixes of our suffix string and see if we already have an entry in our table and if the prefix is a word. If so, we put that into our table. We only need one, so we can break at that point. At the end, we return the answer in our table for the suffix that is the entire string. Running it, we see we get the expected answer, and for curiosity we'll look at the table, and it's similar to what we had in our example. Now, this isn't exactly a bug, but there is an efficiency improvement we can make here. Can you see what it is? If you'd like, pause the video and take a look. When we were checking for prefix plus solved suffix solutions, whenever we found one, we broke out of the loop. But if we find a solution for the entire suffix to that point, we're still going forward. This isn't a bug, because if the table entry gets overwritten, it will just be with a different correct answer, but we should just skip the loop if we have already found an answer. With the constraints we have right now, this is the best solution. But if we know something about the lookup function, we can do slightly better. Take this example. Let's say we know there are no valid words longer than seven letters. 
In that case, a number of these lookups become unnecessary. Once we know this, we can improve to O of k times n, where k is the length of the longest word in the dictionary. For strings this short, it doesn't really matter, but if we're trying to parse a book, it's the difference between seconds and minutes or hours. Here are some interesting problem extensions for you to think about. Our current solution keeps a list of words for each of our sub-answers, but this can take a lot of space, in fact, O of n squared space. One way of getting around this is to just store whether or not there is an answer instead of the answer itself, but then we have to efficiently retrieve the answer at the end. How can you do this? A simpler challenge is, what is the best way to implement the lookup function? Finally, we said at the beginning we are going to consider it a success if we got any single solution, but there are often multiple solutions. How can we return all of the solutions, and interestingly, if we have multiple solutions, what are some good ways of deciding which one is best? This is a popular problem, and I've seen write-ups for it in a few different places. I'll put some notes in the description in case you want to get some different perspectives on it. Next time we'll mix it up and cover a question that is algorithmically simpler but requires more attention to detail. Given a list of ints, return the mean, median, and mode of those ints. Beware, this problem is definitely not algorithmically bankrupt. I hope you've learned something from this video. If you have any questions or comments or things I've missed, let me know in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, please like the video, subscribe, or both. I appreciate it. See you next time on Coder Snacks.